This session is an example of psychoanalytic or psychodynamic therapy. If I were to say one thing about the psychoanalytic perspective, it would be uh, repetition, mm -hmm. repetition of patterns. Whether you're operating from the old-fashioned Freudian perspective or the more modern attachment theory mm -hmm. perspective, both of those perspectives emphasize that individuals develop an internal working model based on early childhood interactions and that that model dictates to some extent that repeating pattern of the way people have relationships as well as certain kinds of conflicts or intrapsychic problems that are manifest over and over. Mm -hmm. And psychoanalytic is a very long therapy process usually so of course it's difficult to squeeze uh, any of those concepts into a 20-minute session. John's listening with Sarah for uh, repeated themes, including the things she brings in, which is concern about blushing. And what you'll probably notice is that the listening that I do is fairly unstructured. It's involving free association or mm -hmm. saying whatever comes to mind, which is one of the techniques that psychoanalytically oriented therapists use. Mm -hmm. In addition, I will occasionally prompt her to explore the past to see if we can make some connections with how these particular problems, the blushing, first arose. Yeah, your goal is to help Sarah begin to explore those repeated patterns in her life. Absolutely, and as I do that, another thing to keep in mind is countertransference, mm -hmm. because countertransference can distort the way I see Sarah's problems. And that's one of the reasons I think from this perspective it's so important to go slowly, to work collaboratively with clients, so that we can make sure that my reactions or my distortions of her problem aren't what's guiding the session and it's really her issue and her problem. So let's watch a, a few minutes of John working with Sarah. So just start with the thought of your face blushing, maybe an image of it in your mind, and then just say whatever comes to mind. Gosh, the words I feel like sound so harsh, but really I think of embarrassment, humiliation. Um, I feel like I look stupid. Um, I, mm. Yeah, those yeah. kinds of things. Pretty harsh things. Mm -hmm. If you go back in time, starting now, but just go way back as early as you can, mm -hmm. can you think of humiliation, embarrassment, experiences where you maybe first started having that kind of flushing? You know, it probably was when I was in college and I there were people that would say, oh my gosh, your face just turned red. Hmm. And I actually had someone that I worked with that would say to me, oh, I just love to embarrass you and watch your face turn red. And I can remember that I hadn't been that aware of it, but then there was just something that it just started, you know, mm -hmm. the awareness, I think, it just started happening more and more often. Yeah. <clears throat> Back in college, mm -hmm. it was an early time when you remember it. Mm -hmm. Can you remember a particular time when you flushed and what was going on then? Um, when I was in high school and the teacher would ask a question, I would feel fine answering a question and speaking up. Mm -hmm. And it, when I got to college, I wouldn't because I was afraid my face would turn red. Mm -hmm. So it's just that, that I'd be in class and I would feel like I had something to contribute, but I didn't want to talk because I thought it would draw attention to myself, mm -hmm. my face turning red, yeah. What might you have said that would make your face turn red? I don't know, I wasn't really worried about the content, but I think that just talking mm -hmm. in a group, it just, I, I knew it would turn red and the idea of it turning red and people thinking, gosh, look how insecure she is, that she can't even talk without her face turning red. I just didn't want to deal with it, so I sort of quit talking mm -hmm. in class, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we started with what causes the flushing mm -hmm. or the blushing. And it seemed like that was related to some things in college and people bringing that to your attention. And as you focused on it more and more, 
it seems to have gotten less and less in control. That, would that be right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so now we've moved to talking about some safety concerns about your children mostly, but just tragedy striking you. Mm -hmm. And again, it seems like maybe in some ways, the more and more you try to control your worry thoughts, the less they feel in control. It kind of feels like they keep getting bigger and bigger. Is that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, they do. And I, you know, I have periods of time where I don't feel this way, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I have a lot of thoughts of just wanting to live like a normal person <laughs> and not having all these thoughts all the time in my head. And I wonder as we're talking now, if I just kind of am living a little anxiously all the time and that's maybe mm -hmm. affecting my, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that's what it feels like right now. Yeah, kind of this underlying anxiety, something might go wrong, mm -hmm. something bad might happen, mm -hmm. something that could be a tragedy. And the first thing you think of is the car accident sort of thing, and what else? What are the kinds of tragedies or just even small bad things might happen? I don't, I, I don't worry about small things, honestly. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I don't, I feel like I'm pretty good about that. I don't want, yeah, I can categorize mm -hmm. things like, okay, with when my kid, my kids play really rough a lot. And I think, well, that would just be a broken limb. So we can that go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when it starts to be, well, that could be a big head injury then, you know, and I think of all that. I mean, mm -hmm. I go through the whole checklist in my head a lot. And I don't feel like, do other people do that? I mean, I don't know. I'm always questioning, like, is this crazy to be just constantly having this in my head? And I think to my kids that I hope that I appear completely calm. <laughs> That's how I want to appear because yeah. I don't want to put this on them. But you'd like it. You'd like to have it in your head less. Mm -hmm. it, whether other people are crazy or whether it's crazy or not, you'd like to have it in your for in sure. your head less. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. what kinds of things have you tried? Well, I always think about whenever I'm challenged with something, I always think about the worst case scenario and I believe completely that I can handle anything. Anything. And I've mm -hmm. gone through mm -hmm. this whole list. Like if I you know, lost my limbs or whatever. <laughs> I can handle anything, but, but I can't handle something happening to my kids. Uh -huh. And that I just, so when I try to approach this logically and think, well, so-and-so has made it through life without a big thing happening. And so-and-so I, I mean, people just have a lot of tragedy. And so mm -hmm. I just come back to that and and feel that underlying nervousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And yet if we go back to the blushing, mm -hmm. that's not a bad thing happening. Uh, someone speaking up in class, not a bad thing happening. And yet that feels kind of out of control too. It does. Cause I really hate to be perceived as stupid. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a thing that goes way back for me too. When I was <clears throat> younger, I had this persona that developed that I was an airhead and I've had to work so hard to kind of, cause I think I used it for a while mm. to my advantage. And then in college again, I had to work so hard to get rid of that whole image and it, it still is kind of in there somewhere, I mm -hmm. think. You still sort of have some fear of being perceived as an airhead, mm -hmm. wanting to prove that you, in fact, are not. Mm -hmm. And you use the word stupid. Mm -hmm. Go with that. Um, I don't know. I just, I really value 
intelligence, I guess. I value it a lot in other people, and I, um, I don't know. I just, I, don't, I hate that I let myself have that persona for so long. It's just, it really bugs me. Mm -hmm. I feel like I could have done other things with my life if I hadn't gone with that so much. Mm -hmm. What was going on to make that seem like a good thing then? Oh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I mean, people gave me attention and laughed, and um, I don't know. What kinds of things did you do? You know, I said some silly things, like, this is in seventh grade, but I, still when I see these people, they'll bring it up. What did, what did you say in seventh grade? <laughs> oh, gosh, really? Yeah. <laughs> um, there was something about a, a pen that had a calculator in it, and the battery died on the cal or the maybe it had a digital clock in it, and the battery died, and I um, didn't think the pen would work anymore because the battery died. <laughs> and I, it was just a split moment thing, but everyone laughed and thought it was hilarious, and I think that's kind of when it started. And so people still, thirty years later, oh, do you have a pen? Sarah, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I can laugh. I mean, I am totally fine laughing at myself. That's not the problem. It's just I just don't want that identity that I'm dumb. Mm -hmm. And you kept it for a while, mm -hmm. like a long time. Yeah. What are some other examples of? Mm, really? <laughs> <laughs> Another one that comes to mind is someone told me that their aunt had had a miscarriage, and I asked her if the baby was all right. Uh-huh. So, you know, because I just wasn't, I knew, I don't know what, that was just a dumb thing to say. I didn't mean to say that, and so that's another thing people bring up 30 years later. Uh-huh. Mm hmm And that doesn't sound intentional. It wasn't. The pen and the miscarriage comment. No. And yet one of the things I kind of hear you saying is, well, that's embarrassing, but it's even maybe more embarrassing that you kind of took on that identity. Mm -hmm. um, Rita, while I was watching the clip of, of Sarah, uh, one thing that I noticed was that kind of repeating or recycling pattern where mm -hmm. initially when she was asked about the blushing, she went back to a college experience. Later, she goes back to a high school experience. And later, she goes back to a seventh grade experience. And what that reminds me of is how maybe resistance is diminished over time. Maybe trust is built. Mm -hmm. um, either way, it seems like as from this model, you look at things in the past, you uncover different perspectives each time. Yeah. One thing I, I noticed during the session is you asked her what she had done before, which can kind of sound behavioral, actually. Right. It might also sound solution focused, but um, the reason for asking that is to really sort of glimpse or study her pattern of trying to resolve the problem herself because that's important to the psychodynamics. And you know, um, in addition, I felt the impulse at one point, like maybe I should have asked her, what do you think I think of you? Which would be right. a question that's very psychoanalytic because it kind of pulls for the transference that mm. might be happening in the session between Sarah and me. Which maybe would have worked or maybe would have been a little early for that kind of reflection. Absolutely. Yeah. So the next clip picks up right where we left off. Exactly. So let's watch. But it's even maybe more embarrassing that you kind of took on that identity? Mm -hmm. Or did you take it on? People put it on you? I think people put it on me after that, and then I went with it after that. Those are the two things that I really remember saying that were the worst. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I just kind of went with it. Mm -hmm. And did you, did you ever intentionally say things that were? Oh, probably. I mean, I really don't remember other things, but I probably yeah. did act the part for a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, As yeah. you talk about it, you, it seems very, not really unsettling, but just like you. Yeah, it of, makes me cringe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about even before seventh grade? 
anything where you felt like you were perceived as stupid? Mm -mm. No, I was actually always pretty smart, <laughs> uh -huh. really. So, no, it was kind of a middle school thing. Mm -hmm. Somehow you carry on this um, sort of remnant from middle school that people might see you as stupid and that carried into college and even now you feel that the blushing might be related to that mm -hmm. thought of maybe I'm maybe I'll be caught maybe I'll be caught looking stupid mm -hmm. yep mm -hmm. and the theme with your children is maybe I'll be caught unprepared maybe tragedy will strike because I'm not prepared? Well, when you say that, it makes me think that, yeah, what if I, what if I wasn't worried? Would that make the odds go up that something could happen? <laughs> what if I wasn't worried about tragedy? What if I wasn't worried about being viewed as stupid or unprepared? Well, when I'm thinking about the tragedy part, I mean, what if I let that go and I just wasn't, it wasn't on my mind all the time, then maybe that would make the odds of it happening go up. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It sounds ridiculous when I say it, but. Yeah, yeah. But you hear this sort of belief in your mind, <clears throat> maybe, maybe worrying about the tragedy helps prevent it. Mm-hmm. Yep. I think that somehow that's what I think. And that that pre prevents it um, even in the absence of any specific precautions? I mean, is it possible to take the precautions and then... Let it go? Let it go? I don't know. Seems like there are some things that are outside your control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. It feels like if I let it go, then what does that mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know. What does it mean? It just, it feels a little bit like now am I being careless if I just let it go? And what comes to my head is do I love them less if I just let it go? Which sounds really weird, mm -hmm. but... Um, I don't know, it feels scary to let it go, I guess. But I want to let it go. Mm -hmm. It would be nice to let it go. Mm -hmm. But somehow there's a little superstition in your head that if I let this go, maybe the odds will be worse and maybe it's a sign that I don't really love them. But worrying about people is a loving thing. Yeah, I guess so. I've not thought of it like that, but that's sort of how it feels like. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it feels that way. <laughs> I mean, it feels so, it sounds so illogical, but it, but that's how it feels right now. But that's, that sort of feels, and when you just go with that, or that, that thought of if I worry, if I worry, then it's love. It's a sign of love. Where do your thoughts go? If I worry. Well, first, I feel like my love for them is so much more than worry. So I don't equate worry with love. Mm -hmm. But if I were to just let things go, I perceive other people having more normal thoughts in their head. And if I perceive like just letting my kids get in a car and just go somewhere and let it go. I, I do. I let them go in car. I mean, I do. Mm -hmm. It's just hard for me. Um, and to imagine myself doing it without having the worry in my head, I don't know. Um, it feels careless. Mm-hmm. And what, is, what does careless mean? Um, then 
then I feel a little bit, I think of being negligent and then I think, and that's when it'll happen. Mm -hmm. Carelessness is negligence. Keep talking about, just talk your thoughts, even as we sit here, whatever comes. I just feel like I'm in this, um, I'm stuck, like I want to stop worrying, I want to live and not live with all this fear, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I feel like I'm bound to it and I'm just stuck all the time mm -hmm. and I want to be able to think about other things and not be thinking about what kind of car my friend's mom drives and is she gonna text or talk on the phone while she's driving my kid and what about the other person and, mm -hmm. and my husband and, you know, <laughs> and I mean crazy things. Like I sometimes will, without anyone knowing it, cause I think I read that being on the left is more dangerous, so I'll switch and make sure they evenly ride on the left and right, and if I put one of them on the safer side, does that mean I love him? I mean, the thoughts are just crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's embarrassing when I hear myself even have these thoughts out loud. Kind of makes Cause I, blush. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I feel like I keep this part, like most, I try not to let people know about it because I know that it's mm -hmm. kind of crazy. And I don't, again, I don't want to put it on my kids. I don't want them to have to live with that. Mm -hmm. <sighs> you spend a lot of time really protecting people. Mm -hmm. mm. Like protecting them from knowing that I... Protecting them from knowing, protecting them from tragedy, worrying about lots of different people who you love, who you love. Um, Who protects you? Um, just me. I mean, <laughs> I do. I, um, my mom was always a little bit like this, mm -hmm. so I do blame some of this on her. <laughs> um, so Talk I, about how she, how did she do it? Oh, she just always was worried and I've been really mad at her in the last few years because she'll bring up some concern and I'm like, if I haven't thought of that concern yet, I certainly don't need to hear it from you because mm. I've thought of every concern. So I've told her, you have to stop putting your worry on me because I've got enough. And I've been really clear that I don't want to live that way. Mm -hmm. She thinks that I am way more this way than she was. I don't know if that's true, mm -hmm. but. So some of it you feel like you've gotten from your mom mm -hmm. over the years and that she was a little bit like this. Mm -hmm. You're not sure, maybe she's even more than you or less than you. I don't think she tried to hide it from us. Uh, she just sort of explicitly worried about your safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you and your sibling? My sister and my brother. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I don't think she tried to hide it from us. I, I am really determined that my kids will live a fun life. <laughs> you'll not only protect them from tragedy, but you'll protect them from their perception of you worrying too right. much. Right, right. You know, Rita, as I watched myself working with Sarah, one thing I noticed is I didn't really do any formal interpretations. Right. And really what I was doing was prompting her to look at her past, mm -hmm. trying to notice what patterns might come up. And I think in a lot of ways that might be more appropriate than jumping in there with right. deeper interpretations. Right, especially at this stage. But the interesting thing is I think Sarah actually had some insight and, and you could kind of feel that in the, in the tape as you watched. Right. Yeah. Right. She was working away, um, and I did notice that toward the end, Rita... The mother came up. And Freud would be very happy 
that that occurred. Yeah, in historic analytic work, all roads lead to the mother. But in reality, we know that it's not just the mother. It's the mother and the father, the caretakers, other significant people in the person's life that somehow shaped that internal working model that eventually causes some issues or difficulties to repeat themselves. And I guess in closing, I just would like to say that Sarah was a fabulous client and that I think she has the potential for lots of insight that might help her work through some of the issues that she presented in the session. Absolutely.